extends a lot of architectures. Now, you don't necessarily want to have, uh, for example, x tensor code on x86, because that makes just no sense and uh, makes bugs available. So you don't do that. So you have to need, you need a way to configure the kernel so that it will not have the parts that are unnecessary in the kernel. So for this, we have this beautiful thing called the kconfig, which are files. And these files define symbols in the kernel, which uh, will be later converted to preprocessor macros, C preprocessor macros. And those can be used to exclude or include code depending on the configuration. I want to mention here that every single architecture has a uh, default configuration. And we'll later cover how to configure the kernel exactly. And uh, <clears throat> what these default configurations do is they just provide these default configurations so that you can actually modify that and you can have ARM code on x86, but that will not work. So you want it to work. So yes, it allows for specific code to be excluded by optional preprocessor macros. So a good example for this is that we have the, uh, the device tree for ARM HOCs, system on chips, which generates quite a huge file. The device tree, what a device tree draw does is that for every single different chip, the interrupts, the memory space, the IOMs are all different on every single chip. It doesn't matter if they use the same hardware, it's the configuration that matters. And for this, they have invented this device tree. And this device tree gets compiled into a binary blob. And that gets included into a kernel. Now, for example, if you do x86 code, or compile our, our new 3.13 kernel for, <coughs> for x86, we don't want to have uh, the device tree inside, because that just makes no sense. Because on x86, we don't have any SOCs in ARMs. So how it's possible that? Unprogrammable buses. Unprogrammable buses. Ones that you can't probe. On the device tree. On x86. Because you would need some device tree for such stuff. No. You would need some kind of a descriptor to tell you what to do. That's the driver. X86, the beauty in x86 is that every different hardware is defined as something. The driver by itself might have a processor defined that says that my interrupt is the 16 ISI IRQ or something. Uh, but on ARM, you don't have these because each manufacturer and each different chip will have a different uh, modification. So you can just define it in the kernel. So take the SM bus, for example. You can probe this. Why can't I probe? It depends on the, on the device. For example, you can... Oh, I understand that you cannot probe on existing devices but, and buses, but... And actually, the six we usually have the same set of hardware in every single machine, so you you can assume that it exists, and if it does not exist, it throws an error, and then you can just continue where you left. Pardon? Uh, I can't hear you. I mean, you panic. Yeah, it depends. For example, if you don't have a keyboard, you have to press a key to continue. But okay. Uh, that happens, you know. You don't necessarily panic. There are other variants of error handling, like oops and warning, etc. That we, well, an oops usually continues in a panic, but uh, that's it. Yeah. So why do we need a configuration? I think I already covered this. We need to allow different configurations. For example, there's uh, like. 20 to 30 different keyboard drivers in Linux, and the driver slash HID slash, yeah, in that driver, in that folder, we have a lot of keyboard drivers, and uh, you can have this, you can exclude them with this configuration, because what you do when you want, don't want to compile a specific file is you, when you have this make file, and uh, I wanted to show you this make file anyways, but I can't show right now. Uh, so this make file contains something like an obj s, 
And inside, there's, you, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with make files and the syntax, but you can have uh, environment variables embedded in the, in the make files. And what actually kconfig does is it exports all the symbols, because kconfig files are looking like, uh, <coughs> the .config file that is generated from the configuration looks like it's just a, you have the name and an equal sign and yes, no, or module. We're going to cover that later. Uh, but uh, so that those are essentially bash or environment variables, and then uh, those get included into the make file, and that's how you can exclude a whole file, for example. And that's what we do with the different keyboard drivers. Uh, headers are lengthy and they are incomprehensible, anyways. But you don't want to see uh, just a header file doing configuration for a specific file, and they're just if def, if def, if def, and then you have to understand that that's impossible anyways. I hope nobody likes those long, long, long if def that usually happen with code anyways. Okay, config symbols. So this is an example of how symbols are defined. So each symbol will be converted to config uh, hyphen star processor defines. That means, for example, if we have a define, I mean, we have a kconfig symbol called uh, eta acpi. I think I'm going to show that later. Eta acpi, and we can that uh, kconfig variable will be converted to config uh, hyphen eta dash acpi per processor defined, and then you will be able to later use that in the kernel code and C code and uh, make files as well if you if you want to do that. So we have a lot of different types, actually two different types for symbols. We have bool, which can be true or false, included or not. This is y and n, so we later to cover this. Uh, true state, which can be built in, which essentially means is the bool true module, so that it will be only included on daemon or by install mode or insert mode uh, applications. You have fours, <coughs> which means that it will never, it will not even be built. It's the same with pull fours. You, you can essentially exclude the code, and that it will not built with the building process. They all can have different default values. So we we'll later see the importance of this in this example. I wanted to show you. Uh, this is a kconfig example that defines the eta hyphen acpi. Uh, that's a very hard topic, actually. ACPI is always hard. So it has the bool, which also defines its name that will be shown in the menu config and in the configuration. I also wanted to show you how to configure, but OK. Uh, so it depends. We can define on what it depends, because that's important. We cannot have uh, ATA ACPI without ACPI. That makes no sense, and it will just spit out a lot of undefined references when you try to insert the mod or you just try to compile it with a built-in constant or something. It also depends on PCI. That's, that's a different story, but it has to depend on PCI because, yes. So it has a default value of yes. Now, if you would do default M, but it's a bool type, then it will spit out an error on building, most likely crash the whole building process, and then you'll just holder down the hole. Uh, so you can define a help as well for, for users who don't necessarily know from ATA ACPS support what does that mean. So what you do is you define a help for this. These are all tab or space separated, so you don't have to you know, type every single line before every single line at help, help, help. But it's just this option adds ATA support for ACPI objects. Now, this uh, kconfig is really relevant now because uh, most of the new MacBooks from June or July in 2013, I'm, I'm not sure, they had a, a problem. We tried to debug for quite a long time. There was a specific object in this ACPI had a bug. One of the length of these were 8 bytes instead of 7 bytes. And the big re problem was that the kernel has this sanity check that checks this length, and when it when the lengths are not equal to what they should be, they just spit out an error. And that, it, it will be mounted, actually, by that GTF field in the ACPI 
BIOS will not be executed, which resulted in a huge performance security, a uh, huge performance and power management loss. Because mostly these GTF is, uh, GTF is seven bytes long because a uh, standard ID controller has seven registers. And what actually the, uh, the software should do with this GTF field is that for every single byte that it's in, that's in the GTF, it should write it to the corresponding register. So byte number one gets written to, byte, uh, to register number one, byte two to register number two, et al. Which is, which is how it should be, but because it's eight, like long, eight, eight byte, uh, bytes long, it shouldn't be able to write it. It just died out. And by disabling this option, the performance was uh, revoked. Yes, it was, it was increased because the, we had another way to apply the GTF later in the code, but this code prevented that from happening. So we still use make files. You, I think you might be wondering where are make files. We have all this configuration stuff, and um, we still use make files. That's that's it. So we we need still a, we need still a way to define relations between the source files. So which different source file depends on something. Obviously, kconfig does that very um, very nicely, but it's a. Uh, it's not enough. We need to also send them the configuration, how to compile. So different files might have uh, different flags that should be defined. And this, this make files, these make files are where uh, the K configuration, the K config files go in. Because this is where we have a separate script in the script directory of the root, which aims to uh, create dependencies and stuff like that that should be in a standard make file. Because I hope everyone has seen that make depths and make stuff like that. You make all make depths and we don't have those rules. We do have those rules actually, but they are defined by kconfig. So GNU makes gives us a pretty cool, conf pretty cool interface to almost everything in a kernel. It can configure the kernel and it can also obviously build the kernel. You can do other cool things like clean and install the kernel to grab and as, uh, to the corresponding places and to grab as well if you properly def, uh, properly configure GNU make. <laughs> uh, and obviously, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. It's, it makes no sense to reinvent the wheel because we have such a powerful tool like make file is. So how do we configure the kernel? We have standard commands. If, if you don't want to tinker with uh, Every single uh, K config sim every single K config symbol, you might be wondering where are the comments that can configure the kernel. Configuration is easy thanks to GNUMAKE because it gives us a pretty cool interface that can configure it, and it's just beautiful. <laughs> uh, the number one I'm going to discuss is the make def config, which is a def hood configuration for your architecture. I don't know. Now, obviously, if you prepend it to devconf, for example, arm64 hyphen devconfig, that will create a default configuration for the arm64 uh, uh, architecture. Or for other architectures, you can do that with Spark 5, Spark Super, something extends as well. But um, you will obviously need a cross compiler to make that work, because if you don't have a cross compiler, it will just fail and just undefined comments and stuff like that. So you also have this mag menu config. It shows an ncursus menu, which was pretty cool and pretty nice configuration. It's, it works in every X terminal. Right? It needs colors, because ncursus needs colors, actually. And here you will see all the trees. Uh, because, you know, we, we've, we, we've seen the depends on uh, on kconfig example site, and we and from that this kconfig script generates a whole new tree, a hierarchy tree, a dependency tree, and make menu config shows this how how this all works and how you can configure something. In. And we also have make random config, which is extremely useful, and everyone should do that four times a week, actually minimum minimum four times a week. So that's beautiful. It generates fully random configuration. And what, it, what it's useful for is uh, we, this can allow us to 
test the kernel because you, we don't want that when you switch on one option and you switch on another or you just mess around and the kernel will fail to be, build or to boot. Now, this random configuration is where most of the tests happen. And if you want to do random configuration, there's Linux distribution, the kernel distribution called Linux-next. Uh, it's maintained by Stefan Rothwell. And what he does is he collects all the subsystem maintainers trees into one single tree, and that's the tree that's called Linux-next. And uh, that tree might have bugs, actually, a lot of bugs, usually. It sometimes even fails to build, but Steven Rothwell fixes them, which for everyone is very thankful. Um, so that's, this is where, when you have cloned the directory of Linux Next, you want to do random configurations on it so you can find the bugs, the different bugs there. The build failures, et al, et al. For example, build, uh, booting failures as well. They're useful. You can build in Q emulator. We've seen a lot of Q emulator um, talks yesterday, the day before. So you might want to take a look at this. It's, very, it's a very easy way to, co to contribute to your kernel and a very useful way to contribute. Now there's a make X config for all the GUI fans out there. So if you, if you don't like the terminal, actually you should like the terminal, the terminal if you're a kernel developer. Um, so with this you get a cool little X window that essentially the same as menu config, but it's in a GUI fashion. And actually, menu config looks way better, in my opinion. But some people think that xconfig is faster. It's their choice. Uh, so now that we have configured a kernel, how do we build it? Uh, we have this make. You only have to type make, but I suppose most of you have multi-core processors here. So you can just use the number of processors under the, after the jobs option. This J is the jobs option. And this M process looks way cooler than make J4. So you might, for example, my computer, uh, my desktop has four, four cores. So you might, so I would type make J4. And that, that will build the kernel extremely fast. Now, the kernel build process will take approximately 10 minutes, depending on your speed. Uh, it really is slow. There are a lot of files to build, and a lot of small files to build, a lot of headers to comprehend for the compiler, kconfig, etc. A lot, a lot of stuff we need to do. Now, after we have actually built a kernel and no errors were spit out, we got a file. Uh, the dollar uh, question mark variable in bash is zero, and everything is fine. We can be happy. Now we want to build the kernel so that we can try it out. That's, that's everything that you should do once you did this. Now, the kernel I find that needs to be booted will be at the architecture boot BZ image for x86. This is the file that you should boot. But in order to boot, you will most likely need an initial RAM disk or an initial RAM file system. Both of them can be generated by Fedora or Ubuntu, whatever you use. I suppose you use Fedora here. Um, so this ends the building. Uh, topic. Now I'm going to cover some kernel APIs. Just a rough example of how the kernel code looks like. So we have this problem. No C library and there's no developer. They mostly flee when they see that, oh my god, I can't even use printf. How do I debug my code? How do I do this? How do I do that? Because I don't have, for example, etoe, so you cannot convert string to integers. integers. But it turns out that most uh, yes, well, it turns out that there's a replacement for most of the parts of the C library. Actually, we have a C library that's able to be linked into the kernel, but that's a whole different topic. So we, for example, for printf, we have printk. What a difference. Just one character. Some people don't even see that. Anyways. So yeah, the relevant parts from the C library are there. And this means that we have uh, VSCM printf. It's, that could be, you know, just, uh, you can print the buffers. You have we have k s s k string to x, which can convert um, string, strings to integer integers. No floats. There are no floats in the kernel. No doubles as well. You don't. That that requires a specific handling method. Floats and the doubles are not usually handled in the 
kernel. We have ssscanf, obviously, which means that we want to scan into variables from a buffer. That's the standard C function. But we don't have scanf. I mean, we don't have scanf, <laughs> which is which should read from the standard input into numbers, I mean, into, into variables that are of variable arguments. We don't have that because obviously there's no standard input in the kernel. How, how would that look? It's, you cannot just type into your keyboard, and then you won't will you won't just have a standard input. Now that the kernel supports symmetric multiprocessing, we need ways to achieve mutual exclusion, which means that no through parallel threads will be able to access the same data or the same data structure or the same instruction as well. Sometimes that's the biggest problem that they reach the same instruction because page faults are some exceptions that we don't want to see. Uh, for this, we have a lot of uh, beautiful thing in the